Short miscellaneous notes, quotes, and blurbs. The cry of the new age is for brotherhood and unity of effort. The spiritual powers of the universe are not standing behind or supporting the arguments of wranglings of modern creeds. Those who build the wall of creeds around their truths are strangling God. India is in the center of the world religion, as it is the birthplace of the Aryan race. It is there that the great white brotherhood, the rulers of world affairs, are located in the sacred temple of Shambhala in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. From the center of world truth has come forth all the creeds and religions of the modern and ancient world. The true Christian knows that there is no such thing as a heathen religion, but that all religions came to the world in the name of the same God from the same center of spiritual truth, with the same ideal, the education of the world. The duty of each truly religious person is to perpetuate not only his own ideals, but those of others that all may grow in their own way. We are all surrounded eternally by problems which come to us in connection with our everyday life. Most people refuse to work out these problems, but seek to shift them onto the shoulders of others. God has given man out of the world a certain people tied to him by relationship, or the common needs of life, and we firmly believe that the Great Father is choosing his saints from among those who best serve their fellow men. Each religious faction in the world today feels perfectly justified in assuming that its final resting place shall be on the right hand of the Father. According to the number of organizations expecting to have a right hand all to themselves, it would seem obvious that deity must have more right hands than the average Hindu idol. Those who would be the greatest among you, let them be the servants of all. There is no doubt that in the majority of cases, so-called religion is a blind alley and not an open road to heaven, as most people think. Hippocrates, father of medicine, described the brain as a sort of gland whose purpose was to keep the head free from humidity. The wonder is that we know what little we do about the brain. Dr. William A. Mayo, in an address in Montreal, predicts that the ultra-microscope will raise the span of life to 70 or more. He also laid great stress upon the value of religion and healing. Evil Eye The Grand Lama of Tibet, most fundamental of fundamentalists, has bowed to science. His mystery palace, the Potala, at Lhasa, now flashes with electricity, according to the apocal word just received. Age after age, the Grand Lama's seclusion has been a byword to awe. Lhasa, the forbidden city, what European had seen it. A few 18th century Capuchin friars, persistent but mostly unsuccessful 19th century explorers. Not until 1904, under armed expedition of Colonel Francis E. Young Husband, was there any adequate description. Since then, things have moved faster in the Buddhist Mecca. A young Tibetan engineer, rugby graduate, who has installed the magic light, was recently reported to be regarded by his fellow natives as in league with the evil one. His machinery was hurled into a gorge. The work went on. Last week, a smallish, modest man with shaven head, oval, slightly pockmarked face, long, pointed, waxed mustaches, promenaded from his Lhasa villa to the Potala, most magnificent of palaces. This was the Grand Lama himself, famed political religious absolute primate of Buddha. Above him, to the topmost of its gold vermilion finials, now caught by the last reflected glow of the sunken sun, soared 436 feet in the air, his ancient palace, crowning a green-clad mountain. The Grand Lama passed within. He pressed a button. A swarm of jeweled lights like golden bees glittered down labyrinthine corridors laughed to dingy scorn the former butterlaps, focused the palace miracle-wise to the night and shroud startled gazers in the valley below. It is well, said the Grand Lama. Remove the butterlaps. Time. At a recent gathering of intelligentsia, during a momentary lull in conversation, the ever-present old soul was heard to say, Yes, I have great psychic powers. I see so many things and go so many places on the astral plane. 
Every night I flutter from planet to planet in my pituitary body. Napoleon's Views on Religion Jesus Christ was the greatest Republican. The merit of Muhammad is that he founded a religion without an inferno. Fanaticism is always the product of persecution. There is no place in a fanatic's head where reason can enter. Man's uneasiness is such that the vagueness and the mystery which religion presents are absolutely necessary to him. To fear death is to make profession of atheism. The Christian religion will always be the most solid support of every government clever enough to use it. The Great Pyramid of Egypt is the center of the hermetic school of occult philosophy, and formed in the days now numbered with the dead the great temple of initiation of the ancient Egyptian priestcraft. From it there poured out into the world the worship of the Serpent of Wisdom, which has been perpetuated among the mound builders of North America and the great ruins of the Maya's glory in Mexico and on the peninsula of Yucatan. There are three grand rooms in the pyramid. The king's chamber represents the third degree of masonry and is sacred to the father, representing the human mind and the brain. The queen's chamber, the second degree, symbolizes the Christ principle, or the human heart. The third chamber represents the power of Jehovah, the Holy Spirit, the first degree of the Blue Lodge, and the form-building centers of human consciousness. Here is a passage from a Wesleyan trustee's minute book of a hundred years ago in England. You are welcome to the use of the schoolhouse to debate all proper questions in, but such things as railway roads and telegraphs are impossible and rank infidelity. There is nothing in the word of God about them, and if God had designed his intelligent creatures to travel at the frightful rate of speed of fifteen miles an hour by steam, it would have been foretold by his holy prophets. These are the devices of Satan to lead immortal souls to hell. In Egypt, in days that are past, a curse was placed upon the defilers of the dead and the sacker of tombs, and as part of an ancient burial service, strange creatures of the other world were supposed to be invoked to remain guardians of the dead. Anyone who is acquainted with the work of Egyptologists in recent years realizes the uncanny way in which the curse of the kings has descended upon the scientific grave robbers of our age. The Bible does not mention the brain once. Edison believes inventions not dangerous but will lead to ultimate peace. On the birthday of the electric light recently celebrated by Thomas A. Edison, the great inventor declared that contrary to the belief of many critics, that inventions in general have not led to war, but have produced a reasoning and questioning age. People are becoming, he believes, more intelligent and will not permit themselves to be exploited by emperors and kings and societies. He advised a young man to turn unhesitatingly to the field of electricity, electric light, heat, and chemical reactions, if he has imagination and the will to work. More remains to be done in the electric field than has already been done. The helium atom has been broken into atoms of hydrogen, he said. It is a theoretical step at present, but it has great possibilities. How great, no man can tell. You remember when Faraday discovered a means of getting electricity from induced magnetism and was asked what good his discovery was. He replied, What good is a baby? It is never safe for a nation to repose on the lap of ignorance. And if there ever was a time when public tranquility was ensured by the absence of knowledge, that season is past. Unthinking stupidity cannot sleep without being appalled by phantoms and shaken by terrors. The improvement of the mass of the people is the grand security for popular liberty, and the neglect of which the politeness, refinement, and knowledge accumulated in the higher orders and wealthier classes will someday perish, like dry grass in the hot fire of popular fury. General Albert Pike College education. Is such training worthwhile to the man who does not specialize in a certain profession such as medicine, law, engineering, or the like? This question often arises in the minds of the high school graduate, the parents who are considering sending their son to college, and even the student who is in his second and third year at a university. One often wonders if it would not prove more beneficial to have the young man enter the business or career of his choice 
and learn from practical experience rather than books. It seems at times that the money and time invested in the pursuit of such subjects as history, psychology, philosophy, and kindred studies are wasted. But there are other advantages than those to be taken into consideration. It has been said by men who have their college degree and are now making a success in the business world that the knowledge obtained from books played the minor part, that it was the confidence inspired in one, the case with which one can conduct himself in a crowd, and the art of making contacts which impressed them with the fact that the time spent in an institution of higher education was well invested. Such qualities are essential to almost every occupation, and most certainly of material benefit if one is to be considered a success. A man without friends can hardly make a success in any phase of life, while the college graduate, with his knowledge of theory, generally starts at the same salary as the man who has not had the advantages of a university education, usually the former, more confident of himself, rapidly strides ahead. He is soon paid with interest for the time and money spent in his training. Statistics show that, although about 1% of American men are college graduates, yet this 1% has furnished 51% of our president's 36% of the members of Congress, 47% of the Speakers of the House, 54% of the Vice Presidents, 62% of the Secretaries of the Treasury, 67% of the Attorneys General, and 69% of the Justices of the Supreme Court. J. H. H. Supreme Council, 33rd Degree Bulletin. The village gossip asseverates that Mr. Hall is the proud possessor of a bishop's curious medieval spiked silver ceremonial ring from the famous collection of Rudolf Valentino. This ring is large and heavy and would seem to indicate that the old bishops could have used it in self-defense should need arise. Virtue by itself is not enough, or anything like enough. Strength must be added to it, and the determination to use that strength. The good man who is ineffective is not able to make his goodness of much account to the people as a whole. No matter how much a man hears the word, small is the credit attached to him if he fails to be a doer also. And in serving the Lord, he must remember that he needs avoid sloth in his business as well as cultivate fervency of spirit. Theodore Roosevelt A local undertaker has called attention to the fact that the body of a vegetarian will keep for several days in good condition without embalming, while the body of a meat-eater or one addicted to liquor is in a dreadful, if not an unmentionable state in just a few hours. Question. What should we do with any knowledge that we have been fortunate enough to gain? Answer. Exercise it by putting it to work, for if it is not used, it will be lost soon. With healthy exercise, all of our physical muscles are strengthened while the neglect of our bodies soon depletes the tissues. It is the same with spiritual powers. If we do not think, the mind soon becomes incapable of thought. If we do not give out the truths we have learned and use them to help our brother man, they soon ferment, causing mental or spiritual indigestion. If we know a truth, it is our duty to give it to all who will receive it, or be helped by it. It is not our duty, however, to force others to believe our doctrines or agree with our concepts of life but we should use in the highest way all the knowledge and spiritual truth which our consciousness is able to conceive, and thus pave the way to greater truths and more complete understanding. Hoard it away for our own personal use, or divide it from our brother by a dollar mark, and it will die within us, and all will be lost. Remember the story of the talents, and what happened to the one who hid his in the earth until the master returned. Instead of following the example of the faithful servants who circulated theirs and gained double the number thereby, it is the same with man, for the things which he knows and can do are his talents. If he does not make good use of each and every one of them, he cannot enter higher spheres of consciousness, and the rewards of the faithful servants cannot be his. The Fool The Fool became dissatisfied with preaching nice, smug sermons to nice, rich, smug parishioners. The fool gave up his fiancée for the sake of his ideal of service. The fool believed in preaching on practical economic conditions instead of a sentimental Christmas sermon and was asked to leave. 
The fool left and tried to bring the strikers and the owners together. The fool gave a practical working solution, which was successful until the owners wanted to save more money. The fool gave his last overcoat and his last dollar to the needy man and befriended the outcast woman and the orphan. The fool was often in danger, slandered, and misunderstood, but the fool saw reformed men and women, the healing of a crippled child, happiness where there had been misery, improved working conditions. The fool, they called him, and refusing to listen to his fool ideas, sank deeper in their misery of selfishness. Was he a fool? The coming man. A man cries out in the wilderness, and he has a terrible thing to tell. He cries aloud to age and youth. His words are hot with the sting of truth, and fierce as the bite of hell. A man cries out in the wilderness, for his heart is raw to the world's distress. His soul is scarred with the people's shame, and his message brands like flame. Oh, his breast is scarred and his hands are torn. He has blazed the trail through hate and scorn. Vice and ignorance, wrong and rack, these are the foes he has beaten back. These are the beasts he holds at bay, and he cries, make way, make way. Make way for the race that is to be, the conquering race, the coming man. Clean, courageous, intrepid, free, pure as the great God's plan. Dream of the ages, a vision dim. Martyrs have burned and died for him. Prophets have preached him unafraid. A man cries out in the wilderness, and the lightning's wrath is in his face. A man cries out in the wilderness, and he pleads for the human race. For I tell you, a race shall come to birth, godlike, glorious on this earth. As far in advance of present man as the heavens that we scan, did we dream it could breed from low desire? Did we dream it could rise from bestial mire? Could the beautiful celestial thing from lust and lek rise spring? A man cries out in the wilderness, and his heart is raw to the world's distress. With terrible truth his feet are shot. Make way, make way for the sons of God. Angela Morgan A country minister is taking leave of an unappreciative flock left them with the following benedictions. Brothers and sisters, I have come to say goodbye. I don't think God loves this church because none of you ever die. I don't think you love each other because I never marry any of you. I don't think you love me because you have not paid my salary. Your donations are moldy fruit and wormy apples, and by their fruits ye shall know them. I'm going to a better place. I have been called to be chaplain of a penitentiary. Where I go, ye cannot come, but I go to prepare a place for you, and may the Lord have mercy on your souls. Goodbye. The Principles of Astrology Natural Tendencies Shown in Horoscope The Two Grand Men of Earth The stars impel, but do not compel, and their vibrations reach this planet in the form of a series of celestial urges. These urges are the natural basis of human expression and cosmic phenomena. Unless man is stronger than his stars, he drifts with the motion of the heavenly bodies, allowing their urge to be his law. The horoscope only shows the natural tendencies. It does not ordain success or failure. It only controls those who are willing to be driven by its little understood forces to unknown ends. The horoscope is not infallible, for it cannot take into account individual willpower. Every so often there is found in nature a thing stronger than its stars. The planets become the servant of such a creature. While to the weak the stars are a menace, to the strong they are a tool, with the aid of which soul and character are built. The so-called evil aspects of a horoscope point out the things we have not yet learned to do well, while the good aspects show us the things and powers we have already attained. Like the laws of nature, the stars are the friends of the wise and the enemies of the foolish. The planet Earth consists of two zodiacal men twisted around the globe, each touching the back of his head with his feet, as shown in pictures of the grand Kabbalistic Macroprosopus. One of these two creatures forms out of his body the surface of the northern hemisphere, and the other, in a similar way, the southern hemisphere. The northern man has his head at zero degree longitude, while the southern man has his head at the 180th meridian of longitude. 
In both cases, measurements begin down the body from the head, down in this case being along parallels of latitude. In both cases, the head is called Aries. These two grand men are parallel with each other, but never meet as they are divided by the hypothetical line of the equator. In astrology, the human body is divided into twelve zodiacal parts, and in a similar way, each of these grand men are divided into twelve parts. In casting the world horoscope, it is therefore necessary to consider the twelve divisions of the grand man of the northern hemisphere, and also the twelve divisions of the grand man in the southern hemisphere making in total 24 divisions or spirits before the throne. In order to understand world astrology, one must be able to visualize these 12 divisions of the northern and the southern hemispheres as being magnified expressions of the familiar cut-up man of the medical almanac. The human body is ruled by the signs of the zodiac as follows. 1. Aries, head. 2. Taurus, throat. 3. Gemini, chest. 4. Cancer, stomach. 5. Leo, heart, 6. Virgo, intestines, 7. Libra, kidneys, 8. Scorpio, generative system, 9. Sagittarius, upper leg, 10. Capricorn, knees, 11. Aquarius, lower leg, 12. Pisces, feet. In the case of the human body, the boundary and area of these signs are largely hypothetical, but upon the surface of the earth, they are more systematically arranged. There are 360 degrees in the circumference of all circles, and the 12 zodiacal signs are each given 30 degrees. The zero degree of longitude at Greenwich, England, is the basis of calculation, while each of the signs are divided from the next by a meridian of longitude. The Grand Man of the Northern Hemisphere is divided according to land area as follows. Aries, Great Britain, part of France, Spain, Portugal, Morocco, Northern Sudan, Iceland, and numerous islands. Taurus, Greenland, Newfoundland, Labrador, Atlantic Ocean Basin, site of ancient Atlantis, the land of the worship of the bull, and a number of small islands and corner of South America. Gemini, United States, east of Mississippi River, eastern Canada, West Indies, Central America, north to peninsula of Yucatan, Venezuela, Colombia, northern Ecuador, and numerous islands. Cancer, United States west from Mississippi River to eastern California, including southern California and lower California, greater part of Mexico, central Canada, and numerous small islands. Leo, extreme western part of United States, namely the northern half of California, Washington, Oregon, western Canada, eastern and central Alaska, a large area of the Pacific Ocean, and numerous islands. Virgo, Western Alaska, Extreme Eastern Siberia, Hawaiian Islands, Aleutian Islands, Pacific Ocean Basin. Libra, Siberia, Pacific Ocean, numerous small islands. Scorpio, Siberia, Manchuria, Korea, Japan, China, Philippine Islands, part of East Indies. Sagittarius, Siberia, Mongolia, China, Tibet, Burma, Siam, Strait Settlements, Indochina, Singapore, Borneo, Northern Sumatra, numerous islands. Capricorn, Siberia, China, Tibet, India, Afghanistan, Persia, and numerous small islands. Aquarius, Siberia, Russia, Asiatic, Turkey, the Holy Land, Persia, Egypt, Abyssinia, Arabia, Cyprus, the Black and Caspian Seas, and also Red Sea. Pisces, Russia, Scandinavia, Europe, small part of England, Algeria, Tripoli, Tunis, Mediterranean Basin, and small islands. The Grand Man of the Southern Hemisphere is divided according to land as follows. Aries, New Zealand, small part Australia, part of Australasian archipelago. Taurus, main body of Australia, New Guinea, Tasmania, and islands of the sea. Gemini, Indian Ocean. Dutch East Indies, southern half, small portion of Australia, numerous islands. Cancer, Indian Ocean, and small islands. Leo, Madagascar, East Africa, Zanzibar, part of Rhodesia, and islands of the sea. Virgo, Rhodesia, West Africa, Angola, Congo, islands of the sea. Libra, South Pacific, and islands of the sea. Scorpio, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, Eastern Bolivia eastern Argentine, and small islands. 
Sagittarius, Chile, Argentine, Bolivia, Western Brazil, Southeastern Peru, Southern Colombia, Eastern Ecuador, a numerous islands. Capricorn, the South Pacific Ocean and small islands in the Antarctic Ocean. Aquarius, South Pacific Ocean, small part of Polynesian group and general small islands. Pisces, Polynesia including Samo. Numerous islands of the Antarctic Ocean. To these areas must be added in the Northern Hemisphere, the Arctic Continent, and to the Southern Hemisphere, the Antarctic Continent, concerning which very little is known except its present unfitness to sustain civilized life. Originally, these two polar continents were highly cultivated and cultured areas, and the frigid zones still bear witness in fossil and prehistoric remains that at one time they were torrid and tropical. These divisions of land surface are purely hypothetical, but upon them the planets play out the drama of cosmic law through a series of urges. At all times the heavenly bodies light the earth through one of these twelve divisions. The planets are called wanderers, for never ceasing in their endless circumnambulation of the sun, they form ever-changing combinations and influence each other through the rates of vibration which they absorb from the sun and radiate through their vital bodies out into the space surrounding them. In the ancient system of geocentric astrology, the sun was termed a planet, for the rotation of the earth upon its axis and the revolution in its orbit resulted in the solar rays also striking it, through all the twelve divisions of its own surface in a periodic clock-like way. The rotation of the earth on its axis causes the sun to pass over the 360 degrees of the earth's surface in 24 hours, or at the rate of 30 degrees in 2 hours. The revolution of the earth around the sun results in the sun passing over the surface of the earth at the rate of 360 degrees in one solar year, or the rate of one sign of 30 degrees in 30 days. It is also to be noted that every nation, race, city, and town has its own horoscope based on the position of the heavenly bodies at the time of their independence from surrounding conditions. The rotation of the earth gives the rising sign of a horoscope and the revolution of the earth around the sun gives the sun sign of a horoscope. One of the planets is throned in each of the twelve signs, either by day or by night. The day throne being called diurnal and the night throne being called nocturnal. The sun and moon each govern one sign only, the sun having no nocturnal phase and the moon having no diurnal phase. The signs and their rulers are as follows. 1. Aries, Mars, 2. Taurus, Venus, 3. Gemini, Mercury, 4. Cancer, Moon, 5. Leo, Sun, 6. Virgo, Mercury, 7. Libra, Venus, 8. Scorpio, Mars, 9. Sagittarius, Jupiter, 10. Capricorn, Saturn, Aquarius, Saturn, and Uranus, 12. Pisces, Jupiter, and Neptune. The key words of the twelve zodiacal signs according to the ancient astrologers were as follows. Aries, assertion, Taurus, tenacity, Gemini, versatility, Cancer, maternity, Leo, nobility, Virgo, serviceability, Libra, artistry, Scorpio, erudition, Aspiration, Sagittarius, Capricorn, ambition, Aquarius, progressiveness, Pisces, unification. The key words of the planets are as follows. Sun, vitality. Moon, fecundity. Mercury, mentality. Venus, ideality. Saturn, conservativeness. Jupiter, humanitarianism. Mars, impetuosity. Uranus, changeability. Neptune, disaster. Twelve signs are divided into three groups of four with their key words as follows. Cardinal, initiative. Fixed, stability. Common, flexibility. The twelve signs are also divided into four groups of three with their key words as follows. Fire, impulsive. Earth, materialistic. Air, intellectual. Water, emotional. The signs are divided as to sex in the following way. Masculine. Aries, Gemini, Leo, Libra, Sagittarius, Aquarius. Feminine. Taurus, Cancer, Virgo, Scorpio, Capricorn, Pisces. The signs of the zodiac are declared human and animal as follows. Human, Gemini, Virgo, last half of Sagittarius, Libra. Animal, Aries, Taurus, Leo, Capricorn, first half of Sagittarius. The following signs are called violent. Aries, Gemini, Scorpio, and Capricorn. 
The double signs are as follows, Gemini, Sagittarius, and Pisces. The fruitful signs are as follows, Taurus, Cancer, Scorpio, Sagittarius, and Pisces. The sterile signs are Aries, Gemini, Leo, and Virgo. The signs Libra, Capricorn, and Aquarius are indifferent as to fecundity. Aries and Libra are equinoxial. Cancer and Capricorn are tropical, and they mark respectively the equinoxes and solstices. Afflictions of the planets, Saturn, crushing, falls, etc., Mars, burning, and fires, Uranus, injuries while traveling, Mercury, neutral, Neptune, drugs, poisons, water, Venus, scratches, blisters, Jupiter, business failures, sun or moon, bad eyes. For further information concerning technical astrology, consult a reputable book on that subject. Let us inspire China, America, and the Chinese problem. Awakening and growth to world power, predicted for ponderous Far East nation. As reported by Eugenia Quickenden, church editor, Los Angeles Examiner. Entirely Christian in its bearing and ideals, though free from any tinge of theology, was the message which Manly P. Hall conveyed to his thousands of followers in Trinity Auditorium yesterday. His address concerned the present turmoil in China. He referred in the beginning to the vastness of the land area in that distant country, to its resources and culture, to its population of 450 million to its annual birth rate running into the millions, to the fact that its inhabitants dwell in less than one-tenth of its area. Endless rows and files of people all going somewhere and everyone looking like everyone else. That was his picture of a crowded street in China's large cities. It will be difficult to remove such a ponderous organism, he said, though if she at once began to roll, she would never stop. But you can't get her to rolling. China is a divided country, he continued, divided by climatic conditions and the types of her people. The greater part of her civilization is in teeming antholes of localized industry, belong to an ancient world. Individually, they are long-suffering people, but when they shall awaken, it shall take the same length of time to quiet them again. They belong in part to the ancient world. One by one they have rid themselves of all things not Chinese. Their ethics, their history, their government are all ancient. To a Chinese his land is the great mother, and he will do anything for her, and will never alienate himself from her. Unique in modern history is this slow-moving, ponderous China. There isn't enough ammunition made to shoot every Chinaman, Yet in order to meet the situation there, several nations have sent several thousand men to her shores. She is moving now, oh slowly, in her effort to get rid of foreign entanglements. You can't blame her, really, for desiring that. Foreign entanglements haven't been successful to any nation that has entertained them. Of course, we don't know the whole truth about the matter, for China doesn't talk. Napoleon was wise enough not to wish to stir China. Are we? In the time to come, China undoubtedly will become a world power, because in her is a permanence that is missing in other nations. Her power, particularly her merchant power, has been greatly underestimated. Almost all the nations have imposed upon China. She knows it, but her time is not yet, and in the meantime she is protected by her ponderous weight. I prophesy that within a few hundred years her population will be doubled. By that time, too, she will be wide awake. Then she could march across the world and leave nothing in her track. Our life is gospel. Yet, it is possible for China to become a powerful instrument in the civilization of the human race. Ours is the world's greatest nation today. To a large degree, our national life is a gospel to other nations. Our attitudes will prevail and affect races yet unborn. Our policies will determine the policies of future peoples. Our ethics and ideals will influence those of other nations, and will influence other races when ours is but history. In our future relationships, we shall have China educated according to the white man's law. What will her weapons be? Hate? Selfishness? Intolerance? Or better things? 
Is she learning from us to respect life and property or to desecrate them? Are we teaching her community understanding? We have done our work according to our law, yet a nation or a race may change its attitudes and aims. There is still time for the white man to remake the fabric of his own civilization. There is room on this planet for all the human family, but room only for one family spirit. In this column I have told before Mr. Hall's custom of commenting prior to each Sunday service on some newspaper clipping of current interest, usually from the pen of Arthur Brisbane. Yesterday he referred to a recent item which related the meeting together for a prayer of a Methodist minister, a Catholic priest and a Jewish rabbi, an occurrence which he heralded as being a step vital in the life of our people, an amalgamation of creeds. The time is coming, he declared when religious unity will prevail. Just prior to his closing prayer, Mr. Hall made an eloquent plea for the abolishment of capital punishment and urged his people to write letters to the representatives endorsing Bill No. 4 to be presented in the State Senate March 11th, recommending the substitution of life imprisonment for the former measure. The whole nation is likely to follow California in this matter, he said, if California goes on record in this vital reform so will the others. The Little Red Man of the Tuileries Who is the Little Red Man of the Tuileries? And how came he to haunt that palace and so frighten Catherine de Medicis? Catherine declared that the Little Red Monster had established himself in the palace appearing and disappearing as he chose. And not only had she seen him, but he had predicted to her that she would die near St. Germain. The Tuileries were too near St. Germain. She would not visit the Abbey of St. Germain, but in vain no one could avoid the hand of destiny. Catherine, dying at the Hotel de Soissons, asked the Benedictine friar, who had just heard her confession, what his name was. Corant de St. Germain, replied the priest. The queen uttered a cry and expired. The little red man showed himself during the night of May 14, 1610 the date of Henry IV's death by the knife of Ravillac. He foretold the troubles of the Fronde to Richard XIV, while that monarch was still a child. The morning following the departure of Louis XVI for Varennes, where he was arrested, this mysterious being was found lying in the king's bed, and he was seen again in 1783. It is said that a soldier keeping guard over Marat's remains, which lay in front of the Tuileries, died of fright at sight of this spectre. Many believe that Napoleon I was visited by a familiar spirit, who was said to be identical with Le Petit Homme Rouge, the Little Red Man. He is said to have appeared to the Little Corporal, for the first time at Cairo, a few days after the Battle of the Pyramids, and to have predicted to the young general his future destiny. M. de Segur, in his Historie de la Grande Armée, says that the emperor received many mysterious warnings at midnight in the winter preceding the Prussian campaign. M. G. Lanotre, quoting from Anecdotes of Napoleon and His Court by Chamberlain, says, In the month of January of that year, the red man, addressing a sentinel on duty on the staircase of the chateau, asked him if he might speak to the emperor. The soldier replying in the negative... The demon, pushing him aside and leaving him unable to move, went quickly up the steps. Whether no one saw him or seeing him dare not stop him, the spirit asked a chamberlain in the Salon de la Pre if he might see Napoleon. M. Da blank replied that no one could enter without permission. I have none, but go and tell him that a man dressed in red with whom he knew in Egypt asks to see him. As soon as Napoleon saw Le Homme Rouge, he shut himself up in his private cabinet with him. A long conversation followed. A few words were overheard. The emperor seemed to be asking some favor, which he was refused. Finally, the door opened. The red man came out, passed quickly through the corridors, and disappeared on the grand staircase, which he was not seen to descend. Whether the story was true or not, it was noised about in Paris, and more than one individual was arrested by the police for repeating it. Under the restoration of Le Homme Rouge, showing himself several days before the assassination of the Duc de Berry, and he also appeared to Louis XVIII on his deathbed, 
that there was a mysterious person who at certain times annoyed the occupants of the Tuileries is not doubted. But who he was, and from whence he came, no historians have ever been able to explain. Reprint from an unsigned article appearing many years ago in an Eastern newspaper. What was the Greek fire? The composition of the Greek fire used by the ancients has been a subject of much controversy, and while it has been pretty generally settled as to what constituted it, yet it is still a discussed question as to all the ingredients it contained. The name Greek fire was applied to the inflammable and destructive compositions which were used in warfare about the Middle Ages, and especially by the Byzantine Greeks at the siege of Constantinople. Lieutenant Colonel Heim, after a close examination of the valuable evidence, concludes that what was distinguished Greek fire from the other fires used in this period was the presence of quicklime, which was well known to give rise to a large development of heat when brought into contact with water. The mixture, then, was composed of such materials as sulfur and naphtha with quicklime, and took fire spontaneously when moistened, whence the name of wet fire or sea fire. The important secret of compounding and directing this artificial flame was imparted in the latter part of the 7th century to the Greeks, or Byzantines, at Constantinople, by Callinicus, a native of Heliopolis in Syria, who deserted from the service of the caliph to that of the emperor. The skill of a chemist and engineer was equivalent to the succor of the fleets and armies, and this discovery or improvement of the military art was fortunately reserved for the distressful period when the degenerate Romans of the East were incapable of contending with the warlike enthusiasm and youthful vigor of the Saracens. This historian who presumes to analyze this extraordinary composition should suspect his own ignorance and that of his Byzantine guides so prone to the marvelous, so careless, and, in this instance, so jealous of the truth. From their obscure and perhaps fallacious hints, it should seem that the principal ingredient of the Greek fire was the naphtha, or liquid bitume, a light, tenacious, and inflammable oil, which springs from the earth. The naphtha was mingled with sulfur, or with the pitch that is extracted from evergreen firs. From this mixture, which produced a thick smoke and a loud explosion, proceeded a fierce and obstinate flame. Instead of being extinguished, it was nourished and quickened by the element of water, and sand or vinegar were the only remedies that could damp the fury of this powerful agent. It was either poured from the ramparts of a besieged town in large boilers, or launched in red-hot balls of stone and iron, or darted in arrows and javelins twisted round with flax and tow, which had deeply imbibed the inflammable oil. Sometimes it was deposited in fire ships, and most commonly emitted through long tubes of copper, which were planted on the prow of a galley, and fancifully shaped into the mouths of savage monsters that seemed to vomit a stream of liquid and consuming fire. The important art was preserved at Constantinople, as the palladium of the state. The secret was confined about 400 years to the Romans of the East. It was at length either discovered or stolen by the Mohammedans, and in the holy wars of Syria and Egypt, they returned an invention contrived against themselves on the heads of the Christians. The use of the Greek, or as it might now be called, the Saracen fire, was continued to the middle of the 14th century. Reprinted from an old Eastern newspaper. Mysteries of Antiquity The Delphi Oracles Although the Delphi Oracles have figured in literature for many ages, and attempts have been made to describe the workings of this custom of the ancient Greeks, little is known today as to how these oracles operated. The most famous of all the oracles was that at Delphi. But the manner in which it was consulted is somewhat confused. There probably was considerable variation at different periods, the tale of a hole from which intoxicating mephitic vapor arose has no early authority, nor is it scientifically probable. The question had to be given in writing, and the responses were uttered by the Pythian priestesses, in early times a maiden, later a woman, more than fifty, attired as a maiden. After chewing the sacred bay and drinking of the spring casotis, 
which was conducted into the temple by artificial channels, she took her seat on the sacred tripod in the inner shrine. Her utterances were reduced to verse and edited by the prophets and the holy men. Wherever the worship of Apollo had fixed its roots, there were sibyls and prophets. For Apollo is nowhere conceivable without the beneficent light of prophecy, streaming out from his abode. The reason why the fame of all the other celebrated seats of Apollo was obscured by that of Delphi lies in a series of exceptional and extraordinary circumstances by which this place was qualified to become a center, not only of the lands in its immediate neighborhood, like the other oracles, but of the whole nation. The sites selected for these oracles generally were marked by some physical property, which fitted them to be the scenes of such miraculous manifestations. They were in a volcanic region, where gas escaping from a fissure in the earth might be inhaled, and the consequent exhilaration or ecstasy, partly real and partly imaginary, was a divine inspiration. At the Pythian Oracle in Delphi, there was thought to be such an exhalation. Others supposed that the priests possessed the secret of manufacturing an exhilarating gas. The seat of this oracle at Delphi was on the southwestern spur of Parnassus, in a valley of Phocis. According to the Homeric hymn to the Pythian Apollo, the god took forcible possession of the oracle soon after his birth, slaying with his earliest bow shot the serpent Pytho, the son of Gaia, who guarded the spot. To atone for this murder, Apollo was forced to fly and pass eight years in menial service before he could return forgiven. The oracle proper was a cleft in the ground in the innermost sanctuary, from which arose cold vapors which had the power of inducing ecstasy. Over the cleft stood a lofty gilded tripod of wood. On this was a circular slab, upon which the seat of the prophetess was placed, in the prosperous times of the oracle, two Pythias acted alternately, with a third to assist them. In the earliest time, the Pythia ascended the tripod only once a year, on the birthday of Apollo. But in later years, she prophesied every day, if the day itself and the sacrifices were not unfavorable. In spite of the references that is made to these oracles, and the familiarity that generally is apparent, little authentic information has ever been learned regarding them or their practices. Unsigned article from an old Eastern newspaper. Jazz versus music. A few sharps and flats. From a lecture on music by Manly P. Hall. Jazz music or jazz art is a perfect picture of the average mind of today. Various hectic peculiarities tied together with discords. There is a rhythm in civilization, hastened over rapid, discordant, not the true rhythm of nature, but the false rhythm of man-made civilization. This false rhythm combines the clang of the streetcar, the honk of the taxi, the riveting machine on the skyscraper, the typewriter, the adding machine, all the hurry, bustle, and hectic rush of modern life. Modern music expresses this false rhythm. The modern dance is an attempt of the body to attune itself to modern music. The result is a peculiar series of antics which closely resemble epilepsy. Great music is the tuning of the human mind to the voice of birds, of trees, of mountains, stars, and celestial harmonies. The great musician must suffer, must be broken by the world, that its false rhythm may no longer bind him, and the true rhythm of nature may well forth from his soul. There are those who have to write music, and there are those who can't help but write music. Some musical compositions and some paintings are perfect in technique, but soulless. Some are crude, but alive. To bring yourself into the presence of peace and harmony is the only remedy for the existing nerve fag of civilization. We have jazzed up our own natures until we don't enjoy life unless we live on the ragged edge. Get away once in a while from the howling, the breaking, the tearing, and the rending, and retire to the silence of the hills. We live in a noisy age, but the closer we are to understanding of the great things, the more silent we are. Veneration produces silence. Feed the spirit of beauty in yourselves as well as your bodies. 
The loss of beauty is the first step in the decay of empires. Instead of a new ministry of beauty, the radio has brought a new ministry of advertising. Like a disease, man is creeping over the earth, destroying everything beautiful that he touches. Japan has never forgotten her ministry to beauty, beauty at every turn, even in the smallest garden plots or poorest homes, a tonic to the lover of the beautiful, a square meal to the soul. The Japanese garden may be too small to walk in, but it is not too small for the mind to roam in. Three ways to minister to beauty. Go into the presence of nature. Cultivate beauty in your surroundings. Seek for beauty in the great arts.